Hey, Finn, how are you? Hello, Sina. I'm very well. How's it going? Very good, thanks. It's such a pleasure to have you on the podcast, Finn, because I know we've been kind of like talking a lot, I think probably for a month now, which is pretty crazy. You you had to go to Italy and, and back and like now we now here we are, right? I'm Indeed. so excited to have you on. I think you're our, I mean, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but I think you are our second or third person who's been on Dragon's Den, um, oh, wow. which is pretty cool. Yeah. Although we've had a few guests that have been on Dragon's Den after I recorded with them. So I don't know if we include them or not, but anyway, it's very interesting. You were one of the sort. You were there quite a, quite a while ago, which is interesting. Obviously, we'll get into it a bit longer, uh, a bit further down the episode. But yeah, it's so it's so amazing to have you on the podcast. I think what would be amazing is if people kind of hear a bit about Pastor Evangelist first before we kind of jump in. Yes, sure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, hopefully, it'll be it'll be interesting for your listeners. So I'm I'm Finn. I'm one of the co-founders of Pastor Evangelists which is essentially a, a fresh pasta and sauce uh, company in the UK. We started out in London in 2016, 2017, selling our sort of first portions of pasta, which uh, at the time were handmade gnocchi with basil pesto, which I, I'm not Italian, you might have guessed, but this is the traditional recipe of my co-founder, Alessandro's uh, nonna. She used to make him gnocchi handmade with pesto. So it seemed a very fitting uh, dish for our first customers to have. But um, yeah, we've been doing the business now for about four or five years. We're primarily an online business, pastorevangers.com, where we sell direct to consumer. So our customers can come and browse a range of, you know, 20, 30 different pasta dishes uh, and get the get the kit basically delivered to their home. So they receive a box with freshly made uh, pasta, you know, a wonderful, really delicious sauce and, you know, various garnishes to finish, whether it's, you know, parmigiano reggiano cheese or, or, you know, fresh herbs, whatever it might be. And what we try and do, our ethos, if you like, is to show that pasta is something more interesting maybe than people knew about originally and can be a much mm. more artisanal, foody product than people knew. So we sell things like um, ragù al cinghiale, which is wild boar ragù from Tuscany, uh, you know, which we serve with handmade pappardelle or, you know, handmade uh, tortelloni, for example, with lobster. So we're trying to do something a bit different, a little bit mm. special uh, and befitting of a really nice date night, for instance. Mm. So that's that's Pastor Evangelist in a nutshell. That's amazing. You really got the Italian accent now as well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I've had plenty of practice. The, <laughs> yes. the Italian is still correct every, every second word, word, though, but I say... That's really funny. Um, yeah, so I guess like when it when it was when you did start it. So when you when you said you were selling the gnocchi, um, I, I imagine was it was it online at first or was it just kind of handing out to people market stalls sort of thing? What was it like? Well, it's a bit embarrassing. It was even it was even more basic and rudimentary than that. Actually, we we went well. We went through Alex went through his phone uh, and basically said to you know twenty friends and family members. You are buying. Uh, you are buying gnocchi with basil pesto tomorrow. Please transfer me a uh, fifteen quid into my bank account, and we'll drop it off. You know. So those were those were really the first sales Pastor Evangelist had. Uh, they were kind of they were kind of uh, forced. I don't know if that sounds like the right word, but we highly encouraged uh, our customers at first. That's crazy. Okay, so then so then you, you dropped it off and they probably gave you some very good feedback and you knew that you were onto something, I guess. I don't know yeah. they were your friends, but you're probably you probably got some good feedback. Yeah, yeah. I mean to to give you the raison d'etre where the concept first came from, you know. Um so it was Alex's idea, which is why I'm mentioning Alessandro here, and he had just finished a a, a luxury smartphone business. He'd basically been selling you know, diamond encrusted smartphones for up to 300k all across the world in the Middle East, launch, launch in Harrods, you know, launch in China, the brand, which you've been doing for 10 years. And, you know, it, it didn't work out. And uh, as a matter of, as it happened, he was at a pasta making masterclass in London with his wife uh, a few weeks later after the business shut down. And, you know, they were making pasta by hand under someone's supervision and tutelage. And he kind of went, you know, this is amazing. This is real craftsmanship. This is as much a craft as making a luxury smartphone with diamonds and so on. This is really yeah. something done by hand artisanally. And people aren't aware of that. You know, we were looking at the category and saying, wow, you've had the likes of Fever Tree come along 
and completely change what tonic water is into something aspirational, premium, interesting, differentiated, glass bottles instead of plastic, better tasting. And we thought, wow, pasta has got to be one of the most eaten uh, goods on the planet, yeah. uh, you know, from the USA to Europe to China to Africa. It's really eaten globally. And yeah. yet there's been no innovation or premiumization in the way that other categories have seen. So for us, it was a no brainer. And, uh, mm. and uh, you know, four or five years on, we still love doing it. And we think that this is as true now as, as then. It's very, very true. Like pasta, it's you kind of the only the only way you can kind of access premium pasta is to go to a restaurant right and then but like there's nothing really kind of that can that can you know solve that other than going to a restaurant like you can buy sort of dry pasta and that sort of thing in the supermarket but it doesn't it doesn't solve that you know the, the same thing which is which is really interesting so i guess you guys saw that and saw that there's a gap for a direct consumer business and so I guess like, how did you scale it up from, I guess, like before Dragon's Den, I guess, when it was like very much just direct consumer business, um, how did you scale up from those initial sort of 20 customers buying the gnocchi forcefully to, <laughs> to sort of like before Dragon's Den to, you know, making that level of revenue? Yes. I mean, there are a few, few things that I remember that I can sort of look back on and go, okay, this sort of, I hate this expression, but it's, it's this move the needle, you know, this got us mm. from, as you said, 20 sales to 200 or whatever. The first one I recall was a partnership we did with a ginger pig, which uh, you listeners might know, but it's a very premium butcher, primarily based in London. They have several different um, locations and we, we basically agreed with them to do a special menu of pasta dishes where we purchased their cuts of meat and created a ginger pig inspired limited edition pasta menu as you know ragu made from their pork shoulder for instance and, and all, all that good stuff and they agreed as part of that to send an email to their customers saying listen pastry evangelist the pasta delivery company have used our cuts this meat check it out see what you think and we had you know we, we had a couple of hundred orders from that which really you know, wow. tiny volumes, uh, you know, relative to what we're doing now. But when you yeah. you asked about the inception and getting that critical mass, that that can be a critical mass moment. Um, you know, and it's tempting to tell you, we also raised a seed round of funding in uh, yeah. 2017, which allowed us to finally start doing some proper paid marketing and, and have proper ads and so on running. But there's lots of small, you know, growth hacking, biz dev kind of things you can be doing before that to get that critical mass whether it is those kind of partnerships or bartering you know even you know asking your friends to to really help get the word out yeah yeah another, another little thing we did at the beginning was we said uh, no one knows pastry evangelist by definition because we have no sales and therefore if we want to sell dtc to a country that doesn't know us online where they can't talk to us and meet us we need to have some modicum of trust to get those customers in. So we said, okay, why don't we have a few celebrity evangelists? So relatively small celebrities who could come on board at the beginning um, in return for a little bit of equity and help, you know, attach their name to our brand and build some trust. So from day one, for instance, we had uh, Prue Leith from Bake Off and a food writer and, and businesswoman in her own right. We had uh, Giles Corran, who since 1997 has been the Times restaurant critic. And we had William Sitwell, who was then uh, Waitrose magazine editor. So these people gave the brand gravitas. And I always say, you know, if if Sue in Aberdeen happened to come to pastorevangers.com, she would hopefully see one of those names and say, ah, I know Prue Leith. If she's involved, yeah. I want to give it a try. I, I'm trusting it enough to give it a try. Uh, versus us, just three random guys in London who really no one knows and no one feels any connection to us to want to try. So that that was also part of the, that initial growth um, growth uh, moment. That's really interesting. How how sort of impactful do you think those sort of that's that's one I haven't that's a growth hack I haven't heard before actually. Going to celebrity, all the other stuff that you mentioned, partnerships, Facebook ads, obviously all that stuff I've heard of before. But the thing going to celebrities, offering them some. I thought you were going to say influencer marketing, but it's very, very different from that um, to a certain degree. You're offering them some level of equity so you can put them on your website, you can put them basically behind the brand to push it even more, which is, yeah. you know, that's that's really interesting. How did you kind of do that at the beginning very briefly, then we'll, then we'll move on? 
I mean, it, it kind of is influencer marketing in a way. It's just, yeah. it's influ- frankly, it's influencer marketing without a budget. Because if you don't have any sort of cash or marketing budget to offer to an influencer or micro celeb or, or whatever it is, you've got to, what else could I offer? And, you know, we, we, we gave them, frankly, some founder shares to help get them involved, get them into the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, when we, when we sold the business, they were able to, you know, also exit with some earnings a few years down the line for what was really a short, uh, you know, a small amount of effort on their part. We agreed with them when we went into it. Uh, you know, you know some some terms, what they would do in return for the business, what our commitments were, and and just sealed the deal like that, basically. Mm, that's really interesting. Okay, Finn, let's talk about Dragons Den for a bit. I know people will be very interested <laughs> in that. Um, really? So, I guess what was I guess what was the reason you went on Dragons? I probably know the answer to that. And uh, I guess paint the story. What was the because I I know what happened, but the people obviously the audience won't know what happened. Yes, yeah, so so we went on Dragon's Den in 2018, asking for I think a 75k investment from the Dragons, and um, you know we took our food on, we served them. The water in the BBC studios wasn't boiling, so I got very flustered trying to boil the bloody pasta to serve five or six dragons, and it wouldn't I think boil. I remember that actually. They, yeah, I think I do remember that. This is quite a while ago, but I think I do remember them complaining about that. <laughs> really, I, it was it was quite painful, but um. As far as I remember, no one said anything. And you know, Deborah Meaden said, "This is delicious." So I was like, "Okay, maybe maybe we're off oh, to a maybe good it's spot. a different pitch." I'm thinking of then because I do remember some people complaining about the water. I think it was like a maybe coffee brand or something like no, that. Yeah. I think I think they have these problems a lot. But the dragons, they you know, the, the producers say to them, "Listen, don't be difficult about the food if it's not perfect, because you know we're on a TV set." Um, but no, they said, uh, <laughs> we, we basically explained to them our funding strategy and the fact that we were losing a lot of money uh, and that it was going to take, you know, several rounds of investment to, to make this work, uh, which is, you know, we were saying this is, this is how growth startups work. So you can either do a small business and be optimized uh, all the way down to EBITDA level from the very beginning and make very, very small amounts of money and have a small but respectable business. Or you can go for something much, much larger, which requires a lot of funding and and time and energy to create a, a real brand that could be worth, you know, significant amount of money in the future. And, you know, they didn't, I don't think they, they got that approach. Um, you know, they're not venture capitalists, right? So they're not geared to think in those terms. So to that end, they called, um, they said we were delusional. And they called us um, Pasta La Disaster in front of 4 million people on on BBC Two at peak time, which was quite funny. And I was conscious as it was being recorded, I was standing there and they'd said this. And I thought this is going to be some sort of bloody cult moment on Dragon's Den, Pasta La Disaster. And I thought, right, Finn, you can either stand here and get upset and get defensive and, you know, start crying, or you can take this for what it is which i mm. thought frankly was really funny i thought it was really funny that i was standing there of all people in a tv studio being branded delusional i found it hilarious so i had to almost stop myself laughing you know because you can you can be, be upset or you can have a laugh about it and, mm. and i thought let's have a laugh about it so yeah that went out in august 2018 more or less a year and a bit into the business um but it was a game changer Mm. So let's talk about, I guess, the the growth before Dragons Den. So what were kind of like, I guess, rough sort of numbers, customers, users, all that sort of feedback? What was it kind of looking like before? Oh, you're pushing my memory now a few years back. I guess we were doing in late, when Dragons Den aired in August 2018, we were maybe doing like 50K a month of revenues, um, okay. maybe a little bit less actually. And I mean, when Dragon's Den aired, the business trebled, lit- literally trebled wow. um, from that really air. Interesting. Yeah. That's really, really interesting. And and especially because you didn't get investment, they were they were frankly quite harsh to you and they, they, they called you guys names, as you mentioned. Um, but that didn't matter, it seems like when it came to your like, bottom line, it didn't matter at all. I mean, the truth is, if you're doing a startup, you have to be prepared to crawl through the mud one way or another. Sometimes it's literal and you're running around like, as we say, Newcastle, a blue-arsed fly. 
uh, and you're doing things that aren't very glamorous, but they need to be done, whether it's carrying boxes or you know hauling things around to simply make an opportunity happen, or you have to go through <laughs> you have to go through the mud in a figurative way. And for me, that whole episode that you know experience and dragons den where they were mudslinging at us yeah i just thought i don't care because i knew that when the episode came out you know the business was going to rocket if i have to stand on tv and be called a, a mug uh, in front of four million people and in turn we get to grow our business three times mm. it's really a no-brainer yeah but i guess in that space like i've had friends mm. that um have been on dragons then Re- very recently but it hasn't aired yet and right. it's kind of that space of time in between they're like oh my god what's this going to do to my business how are they going to air it and all this sort of stuff and they similar experience to you they got very much sort of roasted on the set um probably worse than you if i'm being honest mm-hmm. um but i mean it will, it will air and you'll see um yeah. but i'm not gonna say like their name on on the podcast but yeah it's it was it was quite bad um so it's just like you don't know but i guess like when when it did air, it was a massive game changer for you. And I guess how sort of, was it literally overnight it just changed? It was not even overnight. It was literally minute by minute. I So I had my TV on. I had some friends over to watch the episode. And I had my laptop next to the TV with Shopify, which is the software we use to power our e-commerce. I was just watching the number of uh, visitors to the website augment from, you know, 10 before it aired to 100 as it started airing, to 1,000, to 10,000, 50, to 60, to 70,000. I thought, oh, my goodness. Crazy. I've my never God. seen this much traffic on our website ever. And then I was watching the number of baskets that were preceding the checkout, i.e. how many people were sitting, you know, filling in their card details then. And I and then I watched the orders starting to come through second by second. And I thought, wow. oh, my God, how are we going to deal with all these orders? I'm going to be up for the next three days without a minute's sleep, but it's welcome. And and that's what I mean about startups. You've Mm. you've just got to, when you have an opportunity like that, you need to grab it by the horns. It doesn't matter if you're going to be working for three days on the trot because these things are transformative for your business. So if you put that effort in for a three day ordeal, you know that you're going to save months and months of time and expenditure in the subsequent three months, you know, if you're going to push yourself to give give absolutely all of yourself to a short burst of energy, you can actually save in the long term uh, a lot. And that's what Dragon's Den was for us. That's great. So overall, really positive experience for you, even though you got kind of roasted in the den. I, I, I loved it. I mean, how many people get to can say they went and did Dragon's Den? I, I loved yeah, it. Yeah. I was happy and it was great for the business. That's amazing. So after Dragon's Den, you were still you were still a D2C brand primarily, right? So I guess we've already kind of talked about the growth factors that you used to to scale that D2C brand. But um, wh- at what stage, because I know we talked about it before we hit record, at what stage were you kind of like hitting that point of diminishing marginal returns as it were because i know it's very i have i've got friends that people have been on the podcast before they are very much direct consumer and mm. getting that extra customer over time is very difficult it becomes more and more expensive even though your customer lifetime value might be very good yeah. with as it, as it probably is with you guys but yeah at, at what stage did you kind of hit that or have you not hit it yet I think when we're not quite there yet, it's also hard to say because the pandemic has really muddied the waters. Um, mm. You know, a lot of people who might not have been your natural customer during the pandemic became a natural customer. Uh, we're starting to see that drop off a little bit now, and we're seeing a, a more difficult environment to acquire customers online. You know, at time of recording this in, in November 2021, um, but I don't think we're there yet, and. I, you know, we are primarily still an e-commerce business. About 50, 60% of our revenues is past revenges.com. But I mean, I think to your question, we've we've diversified our channel strategy a lot, uh, mm. our, our distribution uh, channel strategy. And we've got, you know, past revangelist outposts in different parts of the shopping universe. So for instance, if you come into Harrods in, in Knightsbridge in London and visit the food hall, you'll find a pastry evangelist counter, like a, a deli, where you can say yeah, 300 yeah. grams of papadelle, you know, 200 grams of pesto, and our team on the ground will serve you. We have 10 meters away, we have a restaurant where you can come and eat from the pastry evangelist menu, and you'll be served a la carte. 
Um, you know, we sell on a cardo, we sell on not on the high street. We have an event business. Um, we're working with M and S, so we're doing also lots of different things um, in in the eco space. You know, we've opened uh, a, a, a load of dark kitchens, as they're called in London. Um, 13 different dark kitchens where you can order from Pastry Evangelist on Deliveroo and get it delivered to you via Deliveroo. So we call this omni-channel, the idea of rather than having one channel where you put all of your eggs, as it were, in one basket, uh, which was previously for us uh, DTC, about doing lots and lots of different channels and enabling different types of customers to find you in their most natural shopping location. You know, a lot of people my age, I'm 28, won't be shopping on Ocado or in or on a Harrods, more likely to buy on Deliveroo, for instance. Whereas, you know, mm. perhaps my, my you know, my mum or my dad are less likely to find anything on Deliveroo because they don't use it and they wouldn't know how to. So for us, it's about being in as many different places as possible to capture as many different customers as possible and simply bring our brand uh, in, in a delicious way to as many people as possible. Mm. So what was, what was really interesting to me to learn about is that I, I initially thought that these sort of partnerships, and we'll go on to kind of how you got these partnerships, because I think that'll be really interesting. But initially, I thought these sort of this strategy behind doing these partnerships, as you mentioned, was diversifying the revenue, reaching more customers, reaching different customers to what you're kind of already doing at the moment through only only e-commerce. Um, but before we hit record, you said something really interesting where it was actually i'll let you say it but it was more an act of kind of di- diverting those people from different channels to the website which which again it's really interesting so what was kind of the thought process behind that that's right i mean as you were saying before in, in the preamble you know cost per acquisition or cac the amount it costs to acquire a new customer in an e-commerce environment does over time increase and the reason it increases is because the the easiest customers to acquire will come first and once you've worked through acquiring all of the easy customers, they become progressively, you know, less susceptible, frankly, to your marketing. So you have to spend more and more to convert them, to, to make them give it a go, basically. So we said, OK, instead of waiting for this peak in acquisition costs, why don't we set up, you know, outposts where, let's say on a cardo you buy from us, when you get your Ocado delivery, the box has a little flyer in it. And it says, hey, why don't you come and check out pastorevangers.com where we have a wider range, lots of selection and buy from us directly there. So it was about enabling people to find us in these ancillary channels, these outposts, whether Delivery, Ricardo, Harrods, but ultimately to try and guide them back to pastorevangers.com, which is the center of our of our um, omni-channel universe and get them to subscribe with us and hang around with us and enjoy our content and learn about yeah. past because uh, that is really the center of our brand our website so was the thought process with diverting them to the website more more so that you can kind of control that consumer customer journey and also the likelihood of you converting them like expanding that customer lifetime value is, is a lot higher once you kind of own that relationship rather than letting kind of like MS or whoever, Ocado owning that relationship with the customer? That, that's right. I mean, it's a really good question. This is this is one of the key things about e-commerce that, that we love and why I love e-commerce. You have that direct relationship with the consumer. If Pastor Evangelist, for instance, sells on Ocado and someone buys a Pastor Evangelist product on Ocado, the customer is Ocado's. I, I would have no idea if today, you know, you go and buy our, you know, beautiful beef shin ragu on a cardo because you're their customer. We don't have your email. We don't know that you've bought it, your location, your address, your contact, anything like that. Whereas if someone shopped it direct to consumer with us, we own that relationship. So we can email the customer. We can contact the customer. We can gather feedback from the customer and truly being it, having that directness of relationship is the lifeblood for me of growing this brand because when I don't know the answer to something, I simply ask customers, Will co- do customers want this feature? Do they not? We'll survey them. And if you can get, you know, a thousand responses, it's statistically significant. Uh, and, and we're able to do that whenever we need it. So whenever we have an idea or a proposition or a hypothesis, we can literally ask customers. Uh, and that's really powerful. 
it is it is massively powerful you are you're definitely right yeah so i guess very lastly uh, before we wrap up i'd love to know kind of how you actually facilitated those partnerships um i think the harrods one i probably know the answer to because if your previous co or if your co-founder previously was involved with harrods that probably makes sense whereas the other sort of partnerships how do they kind of come come about well alex did used to sell his phone in harrods but it was a completely different part of the harrods Harrods world, which is huge. Believe it or not, the Harrods arrangement actually came about uh, in 2018. I was sitting doing customer service on the live chat because someone had to do it at the time, and it was, and it was me. Um, and someone said, "Oh, hi, I'm I'm the head food buyer of Harrods. We were interested to see if you might like to do a concession in our new food hall." I thought, eh, this has got to be some sort of prank, you know? The head food buyer of Harrods comes onto your live chat on your website. But it wasn't a prank, and and that's how we actually connected over over Zendesk chat, uh, and started that conversation, and you know eventually eventually did it. The other ones, I would say, um, I, I would say a bit of networking and really a refusal to to take no for an answer. You know whether it's been a cardo or you know grillers, for instance. Getting you can't click your fingers and just appear on these channels. You have to. You'll email buyers, they won't respond. You have to find a different way to get in touch. You go via LinkedIn, find someone else in the company who you can speak to, meet for a coffee, meet for a drink, until you eventually break the wall down, striking it from so many different angles. Uh, I, I think that's really the key the key tip there. E-commerce is great because it's your website, it's your store, and you can do what you want. But to do these other channels relies buy in, relies on buy-in from other people. Uh, so good relationship uh, management, good networking. I really think that piece on not taking no for an answer is the key one. And if you can send people pasta to encourage them to respond to your emails, it does help. <laughs> That's a very good tactic, yeah, for sure. Okay, Finn, we're going to have to wrap up there. It's been such a great episode having you on, as expected. Um, I loved having you on the podcast. How can people stay in touch with you and Pasta Evangelists in the meantime? Well, thank you for having me, first and foremost. If you want to keep in touch, uh, feel free to add me on LinkedIn, Finn Lagan, or my Instagram is at Finn Lagan. And um, we also have a delicious, tasty £10 off for your listeners at pastorevangelist.com. Uh, and they can simply um, use, the, use the discount code millennial uh, to enjoy that. Millennial is two L's and two N's, if anyone is quite a difficult one to spell, but it will be in the description anyway, so just copy and paste it um, if you're dyslexic or like me. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me, Finn, on the podcast. Such a, such a pleasure. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we'll stay in touch soon. Thanks so much. Thanks again.